The alarm is out, and everywhere on the lower mainland, from the mountains to the sea, the farmers and the small and prosperous communities of the Fraser Valley are alert and watchful against the most costly of all natural disasters, flood. Well, this is where the, all the action was. If this was the older dike, the water was right here. An observer farther down the lake said that he had seen houses that literally picked up off their foundations and spun around with the force of the water. We could see water out of our living room window as far as we could see. It, it was very strange to see fish boats and barges and things like this right up at the corner here. We had wrapped the drapes around the rods. We'd wrapped the drapes around them and they got soaking wet. It, was, it wasn't high enough. The Fraser River is the most dominant force in British Columbia's landscape. From its headwaters near Mount Robson, it carves its way through 1,200 kilometers of the province's most rugged terrain. At Hope, the Fraser pours from the coastal mountains onto the floodplain, where it continues its journey another 160 kilometers to rendezvous with the Pacific Ocean at Vancouver. It is on this floodplain that people continue to challenge the boundaries of the mighty Fraser River. In 1864, Samuel Brighouse built dikes around several low-lying areas of his home on Lulu Island, now Richmond, to hold back the rising waters that come with the spring flood. This practice continued on up into the valley towards Hope. In 1894, the river struck with a vengeance, reminding settlers they were not as secure as believed. This would be the greatest flood ever recorded. Bridges were washed away, roads disappeared, and existing dike systems were breached. Fortunately, development was sparse and relatively little damage was caused. The standard was now set and all subsequent flood levels would be measured against this flood. This was an alarming indication of the amount of water that could fill the lower Fraser Valley. Immediately, new dikes were built to protect the lands and accommodate rapid growth. The winter of 1947-48 brought with it a particularly heavy snowfall throughout the province. The potential for flood was now in place. During March, April, and early May, temperatures remained unseasonably low, delaying the natural spring runoff process. Suddenly, the temperatures climbed. Combined with warm rains and higher elevations, the tributary watersheds of the larger river systems throughout the province began to swell. By May 15th, the Fraser River had risen 11 and a half feet in mission and was continuing at a furious pace. Nine days later, on May 24th, the Fraser River was demonstrating her awesome power. At mission, the water level had now reached 18 feet. This date would mark the beginning of the most disastrous flood in the history of British Columbia. A day later, the damage began. At Cache Creek, the Bonaparte was overflowing. The evacuation of Agassiz began. In mission, the Fraser River was now a mere six inches below the danger point of 20 feet. On May 26th, the first of a series of breaks in the dikes along the Fraser occurred. A break in the Canadian National Main Line at Hefley Creek forced the trains to be rerouted over the Canadian Pacific Railway. A day later, this too was washed out at Harrison Mills. Again, all trains were redirected, this time over the Canadian National Lines via Hope. On May 28th, the water reached 23 feet at Mission. The Canadian National Main Line was severed at several points below Hope. Vancouver's last railway link with the rest of Canada was now gone. Dikes that were built after the 1894 flood were now failing saturation and erosion taking a heavy toll. Work was abandoned on the Dudney dikes and all efforts were directed to the Matsqui dikes opposite mission. 
As the men worked frantically around the clock, a group of women pulled together to get food out to the workers and cement and support their struggling community. A longtime Fraser Valley resident, Greta Anderson, remembers. My husband suggested I stop by at Beharrell's. That's the beautiful big home down on Beharrell Road. And I got there to find that uh, there were several ladies making sandwiches, making coffee, and uh, he had told them I would be there to deliver the food. It was amazing. Uh, there, were, there would always be five or six ladies. There would be jars of salmon open. Someone was boiling eggs. Someone was making cookies, making muffins. Pies would appear from goodness knows where. It just kept on coming and happening. We wanted to feed the men every three hours, so we would load this into my truck. I would get down to where the men were sandbagging. I suppose it would take us 20 minutes or so while they had some refreshment. Then I would go on to the next road. The men were grateful, believe me. I got stuck once or twice, but, uh, but they were always able-bodied men to push me out, and I was back on the road again. I would go back to the B. Harrell home, probably have a cup of coffee, and Mrs. B. Harrell would insist that I go and have a little sleep. And before I was asleep, I'm sure, she was there reluctantly awakening me again, saying, it's time to go again, Greta. Sorry, but it's time to go again. So I would repeat the same thing over again. Bill and Edith Heppenstall's daughter, Barbara, was a schoolgirl at the time. About a week before the Hatsik Dyke broke, uh, the people in the valley were warned to, to move out because it was just too dangerous to stay there. Fortunately, this barn here was empty due to not having had a chance to make hay yet. And uh, so Dad said, fine, they can use it. So trucks came from Mission and helped the people move. Most of them brought their furniture, or a lot of them brought their furniture here. Each family had their own little section in the barn, and, and well, they just got everything out so quick because of this warning. Some of the stoves came up hot. One even came up with a chop in it. Mission resident Mary Guest's family farm was threatened. When the news came that the dike could break and that the farm could be flooded, my dad decided that he would move his belongings to the back end of the farm. Um, his farm had 11 acres of diked land and 9 acres of undiked land. He knew it couldn't possibly flood because there was a stand of seven cedars that were probably four to 500 years old that had been there during the 94 flood. And so it had, they had never flooded and been killed, so he knew that he was safe up there. May 29th, the river reached 23.7 feet at Mission and the Nicomen Island dikes failed. May 31st, the Matsqui Dike collapsed, fortunately downstream, so that the vast Matsqui Prairie flooded with a slow backfilling action. This avoiding the damage that would have resulted from a surge of debris-filled water from an upstream failure. On June 1st, the Canner Dikes east of the Vetter Canal near Chilliwack broke, flooding the Greendale area. That same day, the troops arrived. The Royal Canadian Army, Navy and Air Force would assist and supervise all flood control efforts. In total, there were now some 30,000 volunteers battling the floodwaters. It was an amazing display of perseverance and cooperation. Just a few miles east of Mission lies Hatsik Prairie, home to some of British Columbia's most fertile farming country. At 9.30 in the morning on June the 3rd, a 100-foot gap collapsed on the railway dike, sending a spectacular wall of water across the low-lying areas. Flood victim Ray Motu's husband, Roland, was on the dike the moment it collapsed. He was the last truck over. And he was just gone over and he saw it through the rear view mirror of his truck. He saw the wires, uh, blue flashes, you know, all over the place. And he saw the, the, the road go behind him. And he said, I was yelling like a madman. He said, and I just floored it. <laughs> like I said, your garden angel was looking after you that day, I tell you. This small area of land would suffer some of the greatest damage of the 1948 flood. Houses and barns were ripped from their foundations. Others were washed miles away from their original site. So great was the torrent of water that within one hour it would flood 1,000 acres. And by nightfall, 
it would cover more than 12 square miles with 15 to 20 feet of water. I sat on the mountainside there and I watched the house disappear. Higher and higher and higher until it hit the eaves and I thought, oh gee, there's my house. There we are, homeless, no place to go. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty bad. A friend of mine had just put her baby outside in the pram to sleep for the morning. Um, she tucked her in the pram, went back in the house, and um, a few minutes later looked out to see that the buggy wheels were covered with water. Well, you can imagine the frantic uh, feeling she had. And Tom Hedges' um, cabin, uh, of course, was uh, getting water in it too. He rushed around and put a, a lot of their belongings up onto the tops of their partitions. And then he went outside and looked around, thought there should be a boat around here somewhere, and there was. By this time it was floating. It was a rowboat nearby. He put his family in, in this rowboat, and but he, was, he could still walk through the water. Uh, walked them up um, across the tracks to safe ground and put them away, and then went back with the boat to help other people get out. When the flood came in, when it was a big wall of water rolling in, and every time it hit a fence, there were cedar posts, you know, and then they just lifted. And every time they lifted, the wires on there would screech. They'd go, screech! And you didn't even have to look. You knew there was go there goes another fence, because you heard that all afternoon. Screech! And then you'd see these, all the fences lying on the water. The valley was completely underwater and would be referred to as Hatsik Lake. Looking out over the plain today, this is difficult to imagine. The Heptonstall family farm's higher elevation placed it at the edge of the floodwaters. And the water was rushing up this way in the valley. The men got the bright idea that they should save the gr grass that was in this field for feed for the animals. Uh, they came with their tractor and uh, mow they mowed it, they raked it, and they manually lifted the grass off and brought it up here because they wanted feed for the uh, cattle that were arriving here because there was no other feed. They had about maybe two hours to, to collect all this off, so it wasn't very long. The army acted quickly to assist in the evacuation of people and animals. They chose a small school as their headquarters. By the time they reached it, however, it was gone. The Heppenstall family farm became home to the army, the Red Cross, and many of the surrounding families. So we were feeding, ran this place as a canteen for everybody. And the first night I was home after school, there were about 25 so soldiers all sleeping on the veranda, plus all the rest we had in the house. The road to the outside world ended in the water in front of the farm. A bridge which had floated free was towed in and became a dock. It became a major connection for the relief of the Hatsik Prairie residents. When the water was at its full height, it would be halfway up the windows or better on this house down here. The uh, bridge that they towed in for a landing was just down the road here. And it was very strange to see big fish boats and army barges right out here in the field and, and all down the road here. It was, gave you a rather a strange feeling. As people coped with the still rising waters, boats became the mode of transportation. We came over this mountain road here and got in a boat down here at Heppenstall's dock and our boat landed up right level with my dad's living room window. We peered in the window and this is when it really hit me that our house was flooded. I realized it wasn't as bad as the people across Farms Road whose houses were completely submerged. Uh, we trundled around the house in the boat, outside of course, and uh, <laughs> up to the area where my dad was where he served us tea in the chicken house. The scene was described as a natural disaster demanding action beyond the resources of British Columbia. Regardless, the floodwaters brought out a remarkable sense of duty and responsibility in all. Newcomer to the valley, Kathy Marcellus, likened the relief effort to the all too recent images of war. In 1948, our imagery um, was still wartime imagery. We, we saw 
what was happening in terms of a, of a major disaster. Um, and um, we, we knew we needed help from the outside, but if, but if all else failed, you know, the community had to do, do it itself. But I think I see the pictures in my head as being almost a continuation of war pictures. We saw the animals coming in. We saw just fa almost refugee families. This is what they were. And when they came into town, then they're just a loose organization of the community that said, what do we do? How do we help these people? With their homes underwater, people moved to any dry accommodations available. My husband had found this little shack in the bush out there. So he moved, my husband moved me and the two kids into this shack, dumped me there because he was working on the dikes and he had to hurry, get right back to it, you know. So there I was as the three-year-old and the one-year-old and this shack, he hadn't even opened it, you know. So I undone the wire on the door, looked inside and there was a pile of horse manure in the middle of the floor <laughs> with a 40-gallon drum of uh, diesel oil, I guess, that had been used and sitting on the floor, nothing else in the shack. So I just took a look at it and I went around behind the shack, sat down on a log and I cried, and I cried. <laughs> Kids were looking at me and I thought, oh, this will never do. So after I had cried, because I had never even cried when the flood came, you know, I watched my house disappear in the water, never even cried. But then after that, I decided, well, I can't, something's gotta be done. So I had a tub of water and a broom, and like I said, I had a can of lye. I don't know where it came from, but I had it. So I dumped the lye in the um, tub. There was a, a brook running by. Then I took the broom and I washed down the walls with the broom, and the, then I took pail after pail of water and I threw it at the walls, the floor, the ceiling, everywhere. And it just ran down because the floor had big cracks in it. The ingenuity of the people I, I think about the Farr family. They herded their cattle some, I guess it'd be eight, 10 miles, up to where the Ledgeview Golf Course is now. There was an old abandoned home and an old abandoned barn. So they herded their cattle, and farmers are very ingenious people. They had uh, thought to bring the milking machine, and they brought a little tractor, and in nothing flat, they had power to do the milking. There are all kinds of things that come floating in when you're at the end of the lake. Uh, one of the things that came floating in nearly into our yard was a manure pile from the neighbors. It could have come from the neighbors or it could have come from three miles away. It was a solid um, pile of manure with the pitchfork still stuck in it. And anyway, it went, it, it went by. We didn't need it because we had all our own manure floating around on the farm. When I was in that shack, one day I was baking bread in the oven and this forest ranger came by and he came, by, came back about 10 minutes later and he stopped and he said, don't leave your kids out. He said, there's a, a, a bear up there with two cubs and she says, they could be dangerous. So I said to him, well, you're not leaving me here. <laughs> I took the two kids and myself and sat in this truck. <laughs> I said, well, no way, I'm staying here. I left the bread in the oven and everything. <laughs> so he drove us up to where the grandpa was grandpa and grandma. So we stayed there until my husband picked us up. June 10th, the floodwaters have peaked at 24.7 feet. The water remained above the danger point level for 33 days. It was a devastating scene. 50,000 acres of land flooded, 16,000 people evacuated, and over 2,000 homes damaged. During this time, people went back for a first look at their flooded homes. Our first venture back, we came by motorboat. Everybody could rent a boat up at Bateman Road. Somebody miraculously turned up there with some boats for rent. So we rented one and we motored out through Matsque Village, all the houses underwater, and um, got to our house and uh, tied the boat up to the doorknob and the water was two feet high. As the water slowly subsided, the extent of the damage became apparent. Uprooted trees, debris and mud, it was obvious there was still much work and heartache ahead. But when we came back to clean up, I, I'm glad I don't really remember because it was kind of awful. 
there were two feet of water in our house, and that's enough to bring it up above the toilet, and you know what that does to the septic. So it was a pretty gory sight. But I guess we just got busy and hauled things out and burned things and started afresh, like everybody else did. Everybody was doing the same thing, so we weren't alone. The women were having to clean out their jars, their canning jars that were in the basement, and they were all filled with silt and rats, so, you know, just all sorts of awful things. But they didn't complain. They were just going ahead and doing it. And um, uh, how extraordinary that they, they all went back. They all went back, and they all just got busy and cleaned up. When I went to see it after the water went down, all the gyp rock, the, uh, the cardboard you know, that holds the gyp rock, that was flapping in the wind. All the, the, was it lime they have in between? That had all disappeared. But the, all, the, all the papers were flying from the gyp rock there, on between, you know, on the walls, between the rooms and things, yeah. And everything was rotting, whatever was left in it. Yeah, my wedding dress went with it. Yeah. We had uh, wrapped the uh, drapes around the rods, thinking it was high enough, but it wasn't. They were all moldy and rotten too, so. After the water receded, there were many more things hung up around the place. And one of them was um, the shed, a roof of a small shed had floated by and settled itself on the top of an apple tree. And um, hanging from the, one of the branches of the apple tree was a kitty car. So this was a new kind of tree house. People uh, kept their stuff here maybe a, a month, six weeks, or it varies because of uh, how soon they got their own homes fixed and could move back. The extent of property damage varied. While all faced major cleanup, many were forced to rebuild. One night, there was a knock came to our door, and a, a man was there who had made a mistake because of our car outside the house. He had thought it was this man whose name was Rex Cox. And he started to tell Jim this tale and I was kind of standing back, eavesdropping. And his story was that when the big break came at Hatsik, his house had been washed through, through the break, and then it had been tied up to a piling. And it was there for some time, and then the CPR workmen had come in to, to start rebuilding the tracks and putting in new pilings, and the house was in the way, and they simply smashed it and sank it. And all his family's photographs and all their precious things were in the attic. And this man was standing outside our door crying. And uh, that's one of my most vivid memories. Even after um, the house was dry, fortunately it was June. It was you know, getting close to the longest day of the year. We had sunshine. And it did dry the homes out fairly quickly. Uh, but then the, the the dust formed in, in the cracks of the floor and the walls, and there was dust coming out of everything. It seemed to me that it was two years before that house really was clean. The hard part for us was that my mom wasn't well. She was, never did get her house in order again, and she did die two years later, just as the, the green grass was starting to grow again and the flowers were growing. While the men battled floodwaters and tended to their livestock, the women of the Fraser Valley were responsible for the continuation of community and day-to-day -day life. The women were still in that mindset. And of course, if there was a crisis, who was going to look after it? It would be the women. And I think perhaps this, this uh, kind of goes with the women of the period, that they, um, they didn't really wait for someone else to do it. They, they, they organized things themselves and did what was necessary. And uh, yes, they did. I think they, well, for one thing, the men had their things they had to do with their fields and their, <clears throat> their cattle and whatever it was they had to look after. But keeping life going for, for family, children, the home, everything, what was done was done by the women. Um, I think it was a period where women were at their strongest, I mean, for a long time. Uh, because we went into the 50s when you know, and you know what happened to 50s women, they be, 
they were encouraged to become dependent and all this sort of thing, you know, Doris Day and all that stuff. <laughs> but the earlier period of women were, were much more able to cope. These are post-war years. The women had been accustomed to getting along. So here we are with the flood. They're faced with it again. They improvise, they compromise, and they socialize, and they get along, and they do the job. Even as individuals struggled to recover their homes and lives, the dikes in the Fraser River Valley were rebuilt. With rapid growth and a growing dependency on flood protection works, British Columbia entered into a cost-sharing program with the federal government in 1968 to improve and standardize the system. The Fraser River Flood Control Program ended in 1995, having rehabilitated 426 kilometers of dikes at a total cost of $143 million. There are now over 1,000 kilometers of dikes throughout British Columbia owned and operated by local governments protecting 120,000 hectares of residential, commercial and farmland. Today it is recognized that an integrated approach works best for the security of flood-threatened communities. History tends to repeat itself. Flooding is part of the natural process in the life cycle of a river. Every major region in British Columbia has experienced flooding in each decade, but none has had the impact of the flood of 1948.